Yeah, so first, uh, since uh, some of you asked me about a couple of the problems I recommended on the quiz, I thought I could start with those before going over uh, other topics. So let me go first with um, these ones. Um, let's see. Okay, so one of the problems uh, that I was asked about what, by the way, if, if you get stuck on one of, in general with the problems, you can always email me um, and I can try to help you out. Uh, that also gives, gives me like a sense of where people are finding the most difficulties. So one that I got, was asked for was uh, this problem 7C um, from the PDF. So let's go there. So in this problem, uh, you had, um, what, 20 paintings, right? Six old masters. Uh, nine French impressionists. And five modern pieces. So um, they're they're all um, they're all twenty different uh, artworks. It's just that they just um, but they can belong to three different types of uh, of art, right? But each of them is kind of like a different uh, painting. Um, so the question in seven C was how many rankings are there if you only care about the type of the type of the painting, meaning like whether it's French impressionist, old master, or modern. So the question is, um, how many rankings are there if um, you only care about the type of the painting? Oops, let me put it like this. Okay. Uh, so again, um, in this type of problems, um, which are called combinatorics problems, like where, where you're thinking about all the possible combinations of something, uh, my rule of thumb is always to kind of work first, like a simple example with low numbers. Uh, I mean, with smaller values of, of, of the numbers so that you can kind of almost like go through all the list of the possibilities so that in that way, uh, you kind of try to extrapolate more easily to what should happen in the general situation. So like my 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 advice, like, for, like if you are not sure what to do uh, is to start with low, with smaller values for with smaller numbers. So start with smaller numbers to try to find like a formula or a pattern. So, I mean, just to do it quick, uh, some, somewhat simple, what would be smaller numbers? Like uh, originally in this problem, there were like 20 paintings. So let's work with something smaller, like six paintings. So let's say there's two of each type. So let's say that you have two old masters, two French and two modern, right? So now there's only a total of six paintings and I'm going, I'm going to call them O1, O2, 
F1, F2, M1, M2. Is that okay? So like, hopefully the letter kind of tells you the type, right? And so there are two of each type. And so those are like the symbols that I'm working with. Is that making sense so far? So for example, um, here's like a possible ranking you could have made. One possible ranking would have, me would have been uh, O1, uh, let's see, yeah. Would have been like O1, F1, F2, M1, M2, O2, right? This is like a possible ranking. All right, so this is the first place, second place, third, fourth, fifth, sixth place, right? But now, what if I write um, O2, F1, F2, M1, M2, O1, right? So what's the difference between um, these two? This is another possible ranking, right? But what's the difference be between these two that I just changed my mind on where, the, where I'm going, which of, um, of like the locations for my, in my ranking for the old master pieces, right? But uh, if you look at the conditions of the problem in this, in the part, part C of this problem, we only care about the type. So if you look at the type, the type of, of, of this problem is old, it's old two followed by two French, followed by two moderns, followed by an old uh, master. And this one is one master followed by two French, followed by two modern, followed by one master. So in, in the way in which we care about the ranking in this, in this last part of the problem, these two rankings give you the same because it's old, you see like it's old French, French, modern, modern, old. So like these two now count as the same, um, as giving you the same ranking. Is that making sense? Since the types are, um, since they have the same order types. The type is old to French to modern old. Is that making sense? Uh, are there any questions about this? Like, if you notice it, like, kind of all, all the problem becomes a lot more easy to understand. And so, like, what's the answer? What's the number? What's the number of possibilities here? So, if you care about all the details of the problem, right? Like if you actually care about which collect which painting is which and not just the type, you would have had like a total of six factorial possibilities, right? For ranking them. If you care about every single detail of the problem. But now uh, that's not the answer because you have to take into account that you're like, you know, you are allowed to kind of interchange the the, the paintings among the among each of their types. So like the actual answer, like since there are two masters, two French and sorry, two French, two modern, two old masters, then you have two factorial, two factorial, two factorial ways to rearrange them. Right, because it is like saying like you're, you have to divide by the number in which you could have rearranged the uh, old masters and then divide by the number in which you could have rearranged the French ones and then the same for the modern ones. Is that making sense? So if you go back to the original problem, you had 20 pieces. So that would have given you 20 factorial options of ranking, but then you have to divide by the fact that um, among the, the a single type, you can rearrange the paintings. So how many were there? Uh, 
of them all masters, six factorial. I mean, six. So that gives you six, six factorial. Then you get nine factorial, and then five factorial. Is that making sense? Are there any questions about this? Professor, I kind of see what you did. I was just still not completely understanding why you divided by those factorials. Uh, it's just uh, like, for example, in, in this case, or it's just like, uh, like, oh, oh, maybe let me start here. Like, is it clear that, uh, you know, is it clear that like this, in this way of counting the, you know, these two possibilities are the same ranking? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so the, the question, like the thing is, um, maybe it would have been met better. Um, okay, uh, let's do it with some, with, with one, uh, <laughs> like to do it a little bit more easily. <laughs> this is why I'm saying that it's always better when it's, uh, it may be confusing because two factorial is just two. Uh, so it, maybe we need three, so the three factorial can make a difference. So let's say you had had only like three old masters and two French, just to make it easier. So three old masters and two French, right? So O1, O2, O3, right? And F1, F2. So what I'm saying, uh, for example, is that, um, okay. Just to even make it more explicit. Right, like this is a possibility, right? In this ranking, uh, I'm putting first all the old masters followed by all the French ones, right? Um, what I'm saying now is that O2, O1, O3, F1, F2, right? Would also give you the same ranking as before. Uh, is that making sense? Because uh, here is three old masters followed by two French, right? Um, is, that, is that okay so far so good okay i think i think i'm starting to see where the factor <laughs> right. is coming from. so, so yeah. how many in how many ways can i put like the three old ones in three factorial ways right uh but then like i could also like kind of modify the old the french ones on my at my own will so that's why you get three in this case like that's why you would get five factorial divided by Three factorial over two factorial. Is that better now? I think it's kind of a problem. My mistake was to have used two and two, but when you have two and three, it kind of makes more sense. Right. Uh, uh, yeah, it's kind of um, like many, um, you know, one way to begin here is always to like think oh, how, how could you make the count if all the differences in the world matter? And then you start like kind of dividing by like the differences, that you, like the things that you're willing to ignore. So here we're going, we're willing to ignore like the order in which, like, you know, we're allowed to move our, our, uh, the order the old ones or like the, the same, the paint is about the same type as long as we preserve in, in the position where the old masters appeared and things like that. So that's why you, you get like this over counting factor. Um, but I mean, yeah, like there are many ways to see it, but usually for these problems, again, my rule of thumb is like start with something small where you're actually convinced of the pro uh, of the number of solutions and then proceed to like the general formula. But no, this is good uh, because again, like it is like something that like, also again, like myself, if I didn't think about it <laughs> with a little bit of time, I would just like go put some stu something stupid because I I kind of do think of this combinatorial problem as, as being weirdly difficult but the math itself is not too hard right because it only involves multiplication and division or whatever but it's kind of like difficult to come up with a, the right model to think about how to count these things I'm not going to like you know do like ask you to do crazy things like with these combinatorics because like uh, it's just kind of like something useful to see like to have um, at the beginning of the course, but uh, they can get really tricky, so. But is it better now? Are there other questions? No, that, I'm good. Uh, good, glad to hear that. Okay, there is another one that was also kind of tricky. Uh, 
where uh, we also have to consider, okay, my kitty wants to eat some food today. You should probably move the plate from her. <laughs> so, so um, the, the other one that was kind of also confusing, I think to, could have been very confusing, um, was this one about the chocolate bars. Um, So let's see, where did I have it? Uh, where was this problem? What was the number of this problem? Just to write it down. Um, anyone remember? Oh, okay. it was problem 13, I, I believe. Um, so I'm going to make it, uh, I mean, in, in that problem, I, it, like the way, um, the, the problem talks about chocolate bars. Let's talk about m and just more easily because like you'll see the solution, like it would be easier for me to draw the solution if I talk about m and So imagine that you just have like m and of a single flavor, right? Because m and comes comes in colors, but let's say like you like, I don't know, like people say that they taste different, but I don't know. Like, so let's just say that you have like four m like four red m and or choose your favorite color. So you just have four m and Or how many, no, let's say, like, just to even make it easier, like, and then I'll, we'll do the generalization. So you have two M&Ms of the same color. Okay. And then uh, you, you have like a group of, of three friends. So the, the, the like, like, again, like the warm up question would be, uh, in how many different ways, how many arrangements are there where you can give like, uh, you know, how, how many different ways can you divide the two M&Ms among the three friends? Okay, so let's ask it like that. In how many ways? And if someone knows the answer, just um, hold on it because I, I do want to let everyone has like, have like a couple minutes, like two or three minutes to think about it. Can you split? the two M&Ms among the three friends. So obviously some would get zero M&Ms, that's totally fine. So we're allowing here for the possibility of getting like, you know, no, like bad, bad luck, someone didn't get any. And someone could also get two, that's totally fine as well. Say hi. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, where did where what happened to my pen for the tablet? Okay. So, think about this problem. Uh, of how many combinations are there? Um, let me give you like maybe three minutes to like the good thing about this number is like it's only three M and uh, two M and M's and three friends, so you can literally go through making the actual list. So maybe already someone knows the answer from a, from a, like an actual formula, but it, it's so, the numbers are so small that you should really go through just listing all the possibilities. So try to list all the possibilities and we'll discuss it like in three minutes, if that, make, if that sounds good. I, we just bring some water and um, come back in a second. So don't say the answer if, if you know it. Uh, okay, so what's the number of com uh, possibilities that you have here to, to spread it out? How, how many ways can you split the eminence? Uh, okay, let's, I think you're right. Uh, I can't agree. Yes, let's see. Four chooses two. That should, that should be fine. Okay, so, so there are only three friends, right? Um, so basically what you could do, like I'm going to do it like again, brute force. Then we think a like you kind of start like primitive answer, which is like just list everything. Then you kind of have to rethink the answer in a way that seems more amenable to being generalized, which makes it easier to generalize. And then you once you kind of are convinced like of the generalization, then you're good to go. So right, like you could do like you know, you have uh three friends, so you could give two zero zero, right? 
And then you kind of start decreasing. Uh, so like the first entry will always be the first friend, second friend, third friend, right? So for, um, then one, one, zero. So this is, um, yeah, this will be first friend, second friend, third friend, right? So below that's what uh, each of them will get on, e on e either each arrangement. Then uh, one, zero, one, zero, two, zero, zero, one, one, and zero, uh, zero, two. And um, so there are six ways. And here's important where we I said at the beginning that all the two M and M's were uh, red because, like, imagine one had been red and the other green, then this is kind of like not clear enough because in this possibility, like, you know, someone could have obtained this could represent like that I, this one got the red one, and then this one the the green one, right? But there, then there would be a case where this one got the green one and the other person got the red one. But I mean, if there are like M and M's, like you know, no one would argue about which M and M they got if they're of the same color, right? Like that's the whole point of like assuming that they are perfectly clones of one another, right? Same size, same same dimensions. It would you wouldn't care about which of the two M red M and M's you got. So that's why uh, it's only six uh, instead of more. There would be more if uh, you also cared about you know. That you know, if the colors have been different and, and that were something important to you, is that making sense? So that's why uh, you get a uh, six way. So far, so good. Any questions up to this point? So now we go come to like uh, the actual interpretation, which is like the more elegant interpretation. This is called the stars at the stars and bars method or approach. Uh, so let's call this, which will like kind of give you like a sense of what the answer should be for two sets two, which uh, shouldn't be clear uh, from now uh, from what I, has been said so far. I think. So. Oh. Let's say why it should be, um, let's call this stars and bars method. Well, instead of representing, so I'm going to write this thing, um, these six answers, but um, in a slightly more diagrammatic way, like with more like pictures. So let me copy first the numbers. So two, zero, zero, one, one, zero. One zero one zero two zero zero one one zero zero two. Okay, so another like um, another way to think about this, uh, how to write down these uh, these combinations is like you can write like a star or a ball or like a circle representing like an M and M. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll try. Okay. So this means like, this means um, that the first friend got two, then this vertical line means that there's like a compartment or division. So that means like that you're going to say how much the second friend got. There's nothing uh, here. So this is empty, right? So there's uh, the second friend got zero and the third friend uh, also got zero. So there's nothing to the right uh, um, of the, of, um, of the second line. So like these lines are kind of dividing like, um give you like the divisions between what each friend got so for example how would this diagram look here like the first friend got one then uh there's a line because i'm going to say what the second friend got and uh which got one and then there's another another line to indicate what the third friend got and the the this th third friend got zero okay what happens in the other case um the first friend got one, then there's a line, the second friend um, got zero, so you can put uh, zero here. 
And then the third friend got one. Maybe I should stop here to see like whether this is make like if these diagrams are making sense. Is, is that okay? Like how I'm drawing the diagram. And then how do the last two look? Just to make sure like we're all on the same page. The first parent got zero, so you should start with the line because you, you didn't get give anything to them. And then you could um, two to the second friend and then zero. And then the, again, like this, something like this. So those are like all the possible diagrams in, in this uh, case. And I mean, usually in, instead of like using a circle, you would use a, a, a star. It's just a, harder to draw a star. So, but that's why this is called the stars and bars method because instead of a circle, you would draw a star. Uh, I just find that like more tedious. Okay. So this is like a, a diagram that is a, a pictorial way to specify, uh, you know, like who got who got what, and it's completely unambiguous, right? If you read the diagram, you would know, you would always be able to 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 say uh, who got what. That is that so far so good. So if you see each diagram is represented by four symbols, right? These symbols can be either like stars or or like for four by four slots. I, maybe I should say, uh, and on each slot you can put either as uh, um, as a circle or a bar, right? So, so you have four positions, and on top of each, you kind of place either uh, a circle or a bar. So, one way to think about it is it's kind of like you, one way to think about the solutions, like again, which is kind of fun, like uh, hard to you know come up with at the first time. But you can think that you have like the numbers one, two, three, four, which represents the positions, and then you have to choose two of them to turn into 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 the M&Ms, right? So out of these four positions, I would choose two to turn into M&Ms, and then that completely specifies like what happens with everything else, right? So for example, in in this configuration, configuration, I chose the first position and the fourth position to become M&Ms or or circles, and that kind of fixes everything else. So that's why the solution is uh, so out of these four positions, out of these four positions. I choose two to become M and M's. Hence, uh, the answer is four chooses two. Is that making sense? Uh, four chooses two is uh, four factorial. Uh, sorry, I should have written that. Four factorial over two factorial, two factorial. So that, uh, right, four factorial is 24 over two times two. So that's six. So that's how you end up with six. Is that okay? So in general, if you had M, M, M and M, and N friends, there are so based on this, like this is where, you, if you are convinced of this small example, you can kind of like see the nail, the, find the right answer almost straight immediately. So what do you think, how many possibilities are there like in general, when you have M, M and M's and N friends, what would you put? Let's start like here. What should you put at the bottom? Okay, so you're giving me, yes, that's the one on the top, right. Um, And then, because like you need like um, you 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 essentially need like n plus n minus one positions to to indicate the diagram. Um, of those 
positions, like you have to turn M of them into the M and M's. So that's why there are like those possibilities. Is that making sense? Are there any questions about this? No problem. Uh, so it's a, again like it's kind of like a very elegant solution, um, and it's kind of like a, and there are many problems which at the end of the day become indistinct. Like the solution is kind of indistinguishable from what we just did. So this star and bars method, it is like very useful like you know there are many problems that just kind of have like the same um flavor uh, as the one i just i just uh i just showed you like here so it's not a, obviously if we were only for handing out chocolate piece that bars like that would be interesting to know but not too useful it's just that many problems can be reinterpreted in the same way and so the solution is uh let's say it goes through this way okay so in in the problem on the pdf like you had 14 chocolate bars and temperance. And with that, you can kind of like, with this information, you can kind of answer easily that problem. Um, is that making sense? So like in the original problem, you had, uh, you had uh, 14 chocolate bars. which are like the 14 M&Ms, uh, five, five friends, right, sorry. So part A was just how to split all of these among the five friends. So it is 14 plus five minus one, chooses five. So that's how you end up um, with well, this is uh, 18 chooses five, which is, a, I, I guess, it's a big number. And in the second problem, um, the condition was that at least every child should get two M&Ms. So once you give each child two M&Ms, there are only four M&Ms left to play with. So that's why you get four plus five minus one um, chooses four. Shouldn't it be 18 chooses four? 18 choose four? Uh, uh, so it is, uh, you're talking about, oh, why am I putting here? Yeah, let me see. Uh, wait, um, 18 chooses for 14, right? Oops. You mean, I, I did this one incorrectly, sorry. Because um, here M is 14. And n is five, right? Which is a, a, which is the same as eighteen chooses four. By the way, uh, if you prefer to see it, uh, right? Um, I don't know if I had said that ever before, but there's like this identity that n chooses k is the same as n chooses n minus k, which is very useful. So that's why that, uh, I mean, that's why these two coincide. Is that good now? Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry, I did screw up uh, part eight. Yeah, that's good, thank you. No, 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 it's good, thanks. Thanks for noticing. Um, and uh, then, yeah. That, question. Uh-huh, sure. Uh, so for B, mm -hmm. I got the same answer, but mm -hmm. why does it not matter like what uh, to toys this uh, right uh, does the kids got? So it's, uh -huh. so shouldn't it be like fourteen choose two for one of the kid, then for another kid is twelve choose two kid for the another kid. Uh Right. The thing is, like, it's kind of like important. That's why you kind of have to pay attention to like the setup of the problem. It may not have been entirely obvious here, 
But in this setup, like, you know, you really have to think that the chocolate bars or the M&Ms, that's why I prefer to use the M&Ms. They're really kind of like the same chocolate bar in the same, like you're purchasing the same brand, the same color, the same size, the same everything, right? So uh, it is like, at the end of the day, the only thing that would matter to you is if whether you got five chocolates, right? Like chocolate bars or three, it wouldn't care. You wouldn't, if they're all the same, you know, you wouldn't care too much about um, which one is which. Like just to give you like a better, a better example, imagine I had $14, right? In terms of $1 bills. Like you would only, if I had to uh, spread it among friends, like you would only care whether you got $5 or $3, not which of these 14 bills like you got. Is that making sense? Uh, so yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it is. Thank you. But it, no, no, it, it, but it's kind of that's also one of the tricky things. But it's kind of like related to this indistinguishability thing. Like no one in the world had ever argued. Like you know, like people would only argue. You gave me seven dollars instead of nine, and I wanted nine. You never would say, "Oh, you didn't choose like the seven bills that I one dollar bills that I wanted," because someone would care. Because in a like in an economic sense, you know, one dollar is one dollar. You know, abstractly, it does. The only thing that matters is that you have a dollar, not like which actual dollar bill you have. Like you have the same purchasing power. So it's kind of in this problem that if, for example, the M and M kind of had like different colors and things like that, then you have to take in more things into account. Um, but in this case, like I kind of like the idea what would have been to, you know, that um, they all are the kind of clones of one another. Um, Yep, that answers the question. Thank you. Good. No, no, it's cool. Uh, so, okay. Well, hope. I mean, again, maybe someone already had answer. Um, had I uh, had already come up with the solution, so this was a little bit um, like repetitive. But hopefully, even if you had already thought about the right answers, like this gave you some um, some new perspective of how to think about these problems. So, okay. So my plan is again, uh, the quiz will take place like around the, the last 30 minutes of class. So I'll, once we get closer to that, I'll tell you what the idea for the quiz is. And now what I was going to move more was kind of tell you tell you a little bit of actual properties of prob what a probability is supposed to satisfy. So that's, this is slightly different from like um, what we have been discussing. So let's just take like a quick three minute break in case you want to grab some water or go to the bathroom. And then once we come back, I'll start telling you some more about like more like theory about what probability is if that sounds good okay um let's see so yeah my as i was saying my the next objective was to talk a little bit about probability um more like from like a theoretical point of view of course we'll keep doing examples and things like that especially back to next week but it's kind of useful to know some actual properties about probabilities uh, so that um, this makes more sense. So, I mean, so that it's easier to solve some like actual examples. So the first, um, some theory about probability, some probability theory. And well, if you get, if you, again, I read in the book, I probably, I should probably suggest you some other things you can read um, if, you, if you're not following the book um, this week, but so that you can have something, some complementary material. But um, if you have read the book, um, and most probability books um, start about uh, talking about a set theory, which is fine. And I'll do that uh, definitely probably uh, Monday or a little bit today if I have time. I prefer to think about it more like in terms of propositions. I think it's a more like uh, closer to how people actually think about it in practice. Uh, the way in which you think want to think about probability in this kind of the, the problems that we will we'll solve in a couple of days is like, well, you're taking a disease test, right? Like a test that will tell you whether you have, like you test positive for a disease, right? Or, or like a disease, like the, the um, test for like a, uh, a, a test, uh, the test for like a particular disease. So the test says that you you test that you tested positive, right? So what's the probability that you actually have the disease, right? Because sometimes like these tests have like some error, right, or some uncertainty. 
or um, what sort what's the probability that it will rain tomorrow if it has been raining for the last three days? That's sort of like the kind of problem that we want to start learning how to analyze. So um, once you get um, once you start thinking about it about it in those terms, like the probability is about like propositions. Okay, so we have to say a little bit about what is the proposi a pro what a proposition is. Probability. So probability has to do with degree uh, of your, I mean, this is like one interpretation of what probability is, but I, I think it's kind of useful. It is related to your degree of belief in a proposition. So what is a proposition? Uh, if you haven't seen that before, a proposition is essentially a statement or a sentence that can be true or false, okay? It's a sentence. Uh, that can be true or false. So here's a, here are a couple of examples. So here's sentence one. Sentence one could be, I like pizza. So th that statement makes sense. And you would think that's either true or false, right? So there's like a truth value that can be true or false. Um, here's a, uh, another statement, um, more a mathematical statement perhaps. Uh, three is a prime number. I mean, in case you have seen what prime number is. I imagine most of you have, but I mean, it's just like prime number just means that it's only the only integers that positive integers that divide are like one and one and the number itself. So so that could have, I mean, that is something you could have expected to be true or false. But here's a sentence that it would under this definition would not be a proposition. Hello. So if you just say as a sentence hello, I mean you I mean that's kind of like expressing like some sort of emotion or like an emotional state. Like you wouldn't necessarily um like uh, like assign to it like a truth value. You wouldn't say hello is either true or false, right? It's just like a way or like you know it has some it has meaning, but it doesn't like have a chance of being true or false, if that makes sense. Um Uh, so far, so good. Are there any questions up to this point? So this one is not a proposition. And these two are propositions. So there are two extreme kinds of propositions like so propositions, again, are just special kinds of sentences and they kind of lie on a spectrum. And once that's uh, one end of the spectrum is called a tautology. Uh, so a tautology is a proposition that will always, that is always true. Uh, so what would be, a, let's call that a T for tautology. So here's like an example of a proposition that is always true. Uh, T 
tomorrow is going to rain or tomorrow is not going to rain. Is that making sense? Like, there's no way that's false, right? You're basically giving both possibilities uh, uh, in your sentence. So how could how could that fail to be true? You know, you're saying it either happens or it doesn't happen, right? Um, is that making sense? Uh, what's another sort of tautology you you could think of uh, that you can come up with? I want to give it a shot. Uh, okay, two is an even number. That's good. That would be um, a tautology. Actually, okay, that that's uh, that's the one of the example of Earth rotates. That you kind of have to be more careful. Uh, it's not something that like. Right, it, there's a difference between you finding out that the earth rotates, right? Like, so that would make it true, but that's kind of, is that different that kind of saying that it had to be necessarily true. So you could imagine kind of like this, the earth holding still, you know? Um, so that's why I wouldn't make it a tautology. Like what you cannot imagine is like there being like a possibility where tomorrow, uh, you know, it, like, so what I'm trying to say is that it, there's a difference between the air still rotating because that could have been true or false. It just happens to be true versus like saying tomorrow I will eat or tomorrow I will not eat. There's no way for that to fail. You know what I mean? Um, so there's like a subtle difference between the two cases. Like, so totally is not something that happens to be true. Um, it's something that there's no way for it to fail. Like it's a lot, more, it's a way more powerful. Like, so if you believe in, you know, like usually get yes, in the statements of mathematics, like what makes mathematics in, important is that kind of like the statements of mathematics are supposed to be tautologies. Well, that's more complicated. Than, I mean, it's like an interesting philosophical thing, but I mean, it's supposed to be like, you cannot deny like a statement, a mathematical statement. Uh, you could imagine, like, for example, you could say F equals MA, that's Newton's second law, right? You could ima imagine like uh, a world where Newton's second law is different, or like you would have found some. Like, well, in fact, like, found, like you know, Newton's law is not true, right? Because like there you have quantum mechanics and other things that replaces it. But I, what I'm trying to say is that there's like a difference between things that just happens to be true versus things that must always be true regardless of like the actual circumstances of the world. So tautology is kind of like the most powerful thing you can be because you are true regardless of what the circumstances are in a sense here's like um um right but it's like a um it is a so yes to be to being an even number it's a fact but it's kind of like uh uh that is a tautology but it's like a fact uh different from the fact of the earth rotating because that to being even it's kind of like you cannot deny that without contradicting yourself basically because of uh, of what how even is defined, right? So, um, like the like the classic example of a tautology is like um, all bachelors are single. Uh, kind of you know yeah because if you think of a bachelor as a non married person, right? So it's kind of like the definition is kind of like single. So like a tautology makes it you know what makes it a tautology is that uh, there's no way to deny that statement without you con contradicting yourself uh so yeah two being an even number is a tautology well right among other things uh, uh, um also like if the laws of physics like you know like we're different like i mean yes there are many um they're like um there are many like circumstantial things like even if you thought of the laws of physics as being like the same throughout time uh it just doesn't have the same character as like saying two plus two equals four like like the earth being like if the earth rotating was like the same as two plus two equals four like i can assure you there would not have been like a 
a sense of discovery of that fact, you know, that you actually have to go in the world and discover it. It just feels, it just has like a different flavor of a statement. Uh, like for example, like the, another, like another statement would be the earth is round or like the earth is not flat, right? Because there's like all these flat earthers. Like, you know, it is like, could you could have imagined like that the earth was flat, you know? Um, so it's not that there's like a contradiction like um, about the earth being flat. Uh, it's just like you happen to find that it is not flat. You know what I mean? But it's just, that's different from saying that it's a tautology. Uh, no, no, like the word would have been different. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying that um, 100%, like the, many things would have changed if the earth were not uh, rotating, for example. But that doesn't mean that it was impossible for the Earth not to rotate. Uh, it could require different laws of physics and other things, but that that doesn't mean it would have been impossible for uh, different laws of physics to exist. Um, you know what I mean? So it's kind of like uh, you know, like there's this inverse gravitational force, like Newton's law, that is one over Earth r squared. Uh, you could imagine like a universe where the Newton's gravitational force is one over R cubed. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, it gets some time, yeah, no, totally. It gets some time to get used to it because it's kind of like bread and butter of like the philosophers, things that not always are like shared among uh, other courses, but it's kind of like there is a difference between something being like true regardless of like the circumstances of the world versus something being uh, true because like particular circumstances of the world. So for example, I uh, like pizza that that is true or false, but it's not a tautology because you could imagine the fact that you like pizza depending on, on hundreds of different factors. And if you had changed one of those factors slightly, you know, you would not have like pizza. You could like, you know, have changed your preferences of whether you like pizza or not. Um, is that making sense? Uh, so here's like a tautology, which is more close to what um, we are interested in, in probability theory. Here's one. Uh, if you throw uh, a dice, uh, let's say like a regular dice, and it lands on, on and um, it lands on a two, then it lands on an even number, right? So if you throw a dice, Is that making sense? And it kind of comes back to this, uh, what someone mentioned in the chat, that two is an even number. This is kind of what makes it this statement a tautology. There's no way that if you get two on a die, when you roll it, throw it, that you wouldn't get a, a, an even number because two is an even number. Is that making sense? But the up, the 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 statement with the sentences reverse, right? That if you throw a, a regular dice and it lands on an even number, then it must land on two, right? So let's think about the reverse one. So reverse statement. If you throw a die and it lands on an even number, then it lands on a two. What do you think about that one? Is that a tautology? Yeah, tautology kind of has to be self-explanatory. It's more like a kind of, yeah, it does feel more like that, yes. So what do you think about the reverse statement? Would that be a tautology? No, it wouldn't be a tautology. It could be true or it could be false, right? Like you can imagine cases where, you know, it, it happens to land on two, but it could also have landed on four or on six, right? So there's, you know, some, it just kind of circumstantial. That's what you would say, you know, 
didn't have to be that it doesn't have to be always that way in a sense like or it does like there's nothing about the statement that forces the premise like what you would say the hypothesis or the knowledge that it landed on an even number that hypothesis does not force the conclusion does that make sense the conclusion here being that it landed on a two so it's not it's kind of some evidence right uh but it's not like absolute evidence of what you want to con of what you want to assert here i'm trying to assert that it has to land on a two based on the evidence that it landed on an even number and that's kind of useful evidence but it's not like an absolute guarantee is that making sense so it's not a tautology Uh, so it depends on um, uh, what you mean by logically direct to a truth. Uh, like that, right? Like that totally is something that's supposed to be truth all like, you know, in every circumstance, under all circumstances, but I'm not sure if like that's what you were trying to say. Uh, um, but like, and this is actually the key, that's, this is actually the sort of like, example we're interested in probability theory where like this happening kind of increases our like you know there's a difference between you saying i don't know anything about a die that i just threw what's the probability of it being a two like that landed on a two versus saying i threw a dice i know the outcome was an even number what's the probability that that's a two you know that difference in knowledge right not knowing anything versus not knowing that uh, it landed on a even number should increase your belief or should increase your guess. Uh, you know, if you were thinking about making bets, that should increase the probability that it actually landed on a two. So saying that it landed on an even number should have like some consequence to to like you know to your belief that it lands on a two. So we'll see that if you don't know anything else, you would like to say what should if you had to make a guess again based on intu your intuitions about how this probability should work. If I told you I landed, I threw a dice, it lands on even number, what's the probability of it being two? What do you think uh, that uh, that number should be? Yeah, it should be one third, right? Because you kind of killed that half of the chances that right? you eliminated one, three, and five as options. So you only leave three, and if you don't know anything now, you should just bet uh, a third on, the, on all of them. Is that making sense? And this is like how like almost all like form of like reasoning takes place, right? Like in when, 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 like on a trial, you want to know if someone is a murderer. You're doing like a, you know, a, again like you're a, you're doing like a randomized experiment in medicine to know whether like a, a potential pharmaceutical is useful or not. You cannot expect there to be like absolute certainty all the time. What you would have is provisional evidence. Right, that could increase or decrease your chances of something being true, and that's kind of what we're trying to quantify. Um, is that making sense? So it is. Um, so this is why I'm saying that the probability some sort is some sort of degree of belief in this interpretation because it is kind of like a way to try to quantify how much you should trust that something will happen. So the idea is that, um, sorry, just to uh, finish this. So in one extreme, you had like the tautologies. These things are always, always true, regardless of what happens with the actual world. Then you have in the middle, more wishy-washy things like regular sentences, like where, like I like pizza, tomorrow is going to rain, et cetera, et cetera. And then in the opposite expect, end of the spectrum, the opposite of a tautology is a contradiction. So the opposite of a tautology or the other end of the spectrum. So if you can think about it, if you want like a diagram, you can put like sentences here. This is like a diagram for sentences. So here you have tautologies. We, here you have like ordinary sentences. And here you have contradictions.
And what's a contradiction? A contradiction, well, I mean, that's probably more common because that's like the word that people do use when they talk. Rarely you will hear someone use the word tautology. Sounds too fancy, but contradiction, that's kind of more common, right? So a contradiction is like something that's false, right? <laughs> A, sent a contradiction is a sentence that is always false. Is that, is that okay? Uh, and again, contradictions, I, I think they're probably more like common. So many just come from mathematics, right? So like, like a silly contradiction would be to say something like, uh, well, uh, two is um, big, like, you know, bigger than zero and less than zero, something very dumb like that. So like two is bigger than zero than zero. But they're like, again, um, they're more sophisticated ones, like, uh, like, um, Let me see if I find uh okay, like one from calculus. <laughs> if you remember calculus. Oh, oh no, like actually, uh, right. This is a classic, right? So uh, a, a, contradic a second contradiction, again, many just come from mathematics. So second contradiction would be to see square, say square root of two is a, is a rational number. So if you remember, square a rational number just means that you can write it as a ratio of two integers, right? Um, like so, a rational number would be like three fifths or four sevenths. And so, if you think asserting that square root of two is a rational number is a contradiction, and that's the proof of that is kind of fun, and that's kind of like the first, almost like one of the first proofs by contradiction that it was ever discovered in history of humanity. The Pythagoreans gave a proof of it, like. Uh, so again, it's not, this one is a better statement because it's not by all, by any means like obvious, right? Like the first contradiction that I gave you was kind of obvious. This one actually requires some work, you know, saying that something that the second was a, is a contradiction. So I'm just saying contradictions can be like quite sophisticated. It's not, uh, they're not always silly looking. Is that making sense? So you just have, but I'm just saying like the point of a contradiction is again, that it will always be false. Like there's a way to, for the statement to be true sometimes. Uh, so that's why they are the extreme end of tautology. And again, that's a lot very common, like in law and other things, right? So in law, when you're trying to convince a jury, then you will say, well, if you assume what this, like the other person is saying, then you reach like an absurd conclusion, right? So you, re you reach like a, con a contradiction. So in debates or many things, like this is kind of like an important tool to have, like a toolkit, like, you know, detecting contradictions. Is that making sense?
So what's a probability? What 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 is a probability supposed to do? Or what what do you have, have like a um, what's the point of probability? The goal of probability is to assign. Um, so how can you think of, of probability theory? Well, the idea is that it assigns to each sentence a number between zero and one. So, okay, so here you're going to have like a sentence or like a proposition or like, well, I should have said like a proposition. Let's call it S because otherwise it will be too confusing. So it's kind of like a sentence again, that can be true or false. And the a, a probability, the probability of S is you should think about it kind of as again like some sort of degree of belief that S is true. So you can think of it as some sort of degree. So it's going to be a number between, we take it to be a, a number between zero and one. So the probability of any sent, any proposition or any sentence will be, will be between zero and one. Okay. And it just has some, like, we just require it to satisfy some natural conditions, but it, but it must satisfy some natural conditions. So the first one is what should be the probability of a tautology? Hundred percent or one, I guess. Right. If something is a tautology, you should always bet your life on it. Right. Think of it in terms of betting games. So if you so if, if you know something is true all the time, you should bet on that often. So, are tautologies sometimes like silly statements? Like a book is a book. Like something that's like right. And the, in like in a philosophical circles, a tautology would be something like. A is A, like a book is a book. Yeah, that's kind of like the basic, actually that's like the other Aristotelian law of identity. <laughs> so like the Aristotle's law, when he, Aristotle was kind of like the first one who developed logic systematically and his first law is A is A, right? You can like A representing any object, right? An object is itself. Look, you cannot deny that without contradicting yourself. Like that's, so yeah, like the stillest tautology would be like a book is a book, but a sophisticated tautology would be like, there are infinitely many primes. Like, in a, like I mean, and that's not, a, you kind of don't necessarily think about it that way because like you, there's some sort of sense of discovery, right? You know, um, because it's not something that seems so obvious, but it's kind of like, uh, it's kind of just like a tautology in the sense that you cannot deny that without uh, reaching a contradiction because if you deny that there is a proof that, you know, if you assume that there are finitely many primes, you reach a contradiction, so. Um, but yeah, tautologies, like psychologically, they can go from very stupid, very silly looking. Uh, right, a tautology is an object, is an act or not an act, yeah. Uh, so yeah, those are kind of like on the spec and on the psychological spectrum, um, they seem very stupid to like tautologies that give you $1 million prices. So there's like this millennium prices in mathematics about solving um, some of the most important problems in mathematics. And there's seven, one has already been solved, but if you solve one of the <laughs> other six, you get a million dollars. But it's still considered like in, from this philosophical or pro, um, definitional perspective, it's a tautology. So there are tautologies that if you show that there are, there are statements that if you show their tautologies, you get a $1 million. Like, 
an eternal fame. So, um, so it's like you know, it's like in in terms of degree of like, um, you know how silly they look, they move very widely. Um, okay. And then uh, the other, what do you think? Like, so the other end of the spectrum is, what should you bet on a contradiction? What, uh, what should your degree of belief in a contradiction be? Okay. You are going to destroy my keyboard. <laughs> yes, it should be zero. And you are also going to destroy the keyboard. <laughs> So yeah, the, you should. Uh, yeah, there are two siblings, two kitties, four months old, <laughs> uh, two girls. So you should bet zero on a contradiction, right? You should never trust a contradiction. And again, uh, some of these contradictions can be quite sophisticated. Like square root of two is rational. Uh, that require, like you know, that is a contradiction that requires like. So I'm thinking it's not obvious that that's a contradiction. Uh, in fact, that kind of destroyed, um, you know, when the Pythagoreans proved that root of two is irrational, that kind of destroyed a lot of the worldview of the ancient Greek philosophers. So it was kind of controversial. There's like a myth that they kept it a secret and killed the person so that they wouldn't disclose that secret. So even like in contradictions, like, you know, people or like, I mean, principle, principle like people died uh, at the very beginning of those. So, okay. And then, uh, uh, if you have, and just to finish before moving to the quiz, and then I'll tell you more properties next time. So if you have a sentence, you can take the negation of that sentence. Um, let me write it like, that. I haven't gone into this, but it will be very natural. So you have a sentence as, uh, well, that's what people say. I mean, they were like a cult. So they did have like weird things. So it's not so clear how how much they really how violent they were. But they are like at least it's a funny uh, uh, story that like they 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 killed someone for that. Uh, but I, I'm not sure. Like you know, like that could be true. But it's a fun thing to tell. But they did have like weird beliefs. Uh, I mean, by our standards. So um, they had like yeah, some interesting things. So every sentence has a negation. Uh, I'll call the negation, like this will look a little bit weird at the moment, as C. This C will represent complement. Uh, so this C stands for complement. But for now, you don't have to worry too much about it. But what, what would be like, What's, for example, the negation of a sentence? So if my sentence is, I like pizza. The negation would be, I do not like pizza. So it's relatively straightforward. You just deny whatever your, your sentence is. OK. If your sentence is tomorrow is going to rain, the negation would be tomorrow is not going to rain, right? Is that making sense? So what do you think the negation of a tautology is? based on this examples. The indication of a tautology should be what? A contradiction, perfect, yeah. And the negation of a contradiction should be a tautology, right? Is that making sense? It should be a tautology. Or is a tautology. That's true, actually. It's a tautology. Okay. 
So based on that, um, <laughs> based on that, uh, so you see like, uh, so like the negation in the extreme cases change the, the value of the probability from one to zero or from zero to one. So kind of like the third rule is very natural. Like another rule that you would have uh, is like, if you didn't have like, um, if you had like an ordinary sentence, so this is like rule three or like an expectation of what the probability should satisfy. If you have like the, how should be the, the value of the negation of a sentence be related to the, how the how should the probability of a negation be related to the uh, probability of the original sentence? What should be the gener the relation in, in the general case? Is yeah, my, what, right. Sorry. <laughs> Oh, yeah, you can talk. You can talk. Sorry about that. I, I turned off my chat, but yeah, I was going to say something. One minus P of S, or you could just say right. that P of S plus P of S complement will always be one. Right. That's actually, that will be more suggestive for what we'll talk about on Monday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But in, in, right, because that will be generalized to the case when the propositions are disjoint, uh, which I have to explain what that means next time. But right, it, it's kind of natural, you know. Uh, in terms of belief, because that's what happens with contradictions and tautologies, that like in the intermediate cases, it's just one minus the, the original probability. So again, this is kind of like something that's postulated. That's an expectation that we have, we want about what, what a probability is supposed to be to satisfy. It's not something that you can prove because that's kind of what you're defining the probability to satisfy. You know, it's kind of what we want probably. So you have you will only find the probability uh, if you have if you find something that satisfies it. Otherwise, it wouldn't be called a probability. So it's kind of part of the the, the package of what it means to be a probability. Is that making sense? So yeah, there are a couple like there's only like one more property that I start, I still have to tell you, which I'll tell you on Monday because that requires a couple more minutes because we have to talk about two propositions being uh, disjoint. That just means that they cannot be true at the same time, basically. Or they're not, um, you know, the, I, but I mean, I have to tell you a little bit about the and and or of sentences, which is very natural, but it's still good to take uh, a little bit of time to go over it. Um, and once we have these things in place, and by the way, this is actually, actually what we used uh, last time for the birthday problem. So for the birthday problem, we found the probability that everyone would be born on a different day. And then the probability that two would, would share, you know, at least two people would share at least uh, one birthday was one minus the probability we found. You see, so we were actually actually secretly taking the, the, the negation or the complement of the sentence. The sentence being that everyone was everyone in the group of friends was born on a different day. So we already were using some secret idea. Hidden in our calculations from the past, we already were using some ideas from, from, from this stuff. Um, so, Okay, I think this is a good place to end. I mean, I'll switch to the quiz part of the core uh, of today. So I don't know if there are any questions before we switch, switch to that. Um, wait, give me a second. Okay, okay. So there are only two things okay that I wanted to say before you take the quiz. So for like this is like one of the reasons why uh, we're doing the quizzes at the end of the class is that once you're done with the quiz, you can you know you don't have to log in again back to Zoom. Uh, so the quiz is going to take place on Canvas. You will find I, I have to make it active, so it's still you still cannot find it on Canvas. I'm about to activate it after I say what I, I need to say now. So uh, you'll take it through Respondents. Hopefully that works for everyone. I mean today is like the first quiz, so it's more like for you to try it out. Uh, See how it all goes. So the idea is, I think this quiz I'm giving you 25 minutes for to take it. It's just two questions, so it should be relatively fast. Uh, when you are taking the quiz, uh, just um, write your solutions. Uh, for this problem, the solutions are just like one or two sentences. So it's not that I'm expecting you to actually write a lot of things. It's just like again more for you to try it for next times where we will actually have something else, more details to to say. And then after you're done with the quiz there's something called gray scope which you see here and there should be like an assignment on gray scope that you can use to uh, uh, upload your solutions so just take like a screenshot of what you write on your note paper uh, and upload it as a single pdf 
No, for here, like I just expecting you to, you know, don't don't say too much. Like you know, uh, it, like for example, don't like don't write just like seventy. If seventy is like five, well, seventy is not five factorial, but you know what I mean. It's, you know, just write like the answers, like kind of in a way that seems like you you didn't just like memorize the number. So, but yeah, I mean, don't. It's more like you know, it, write like four chooses two instead of like just writing what that number is. Like you know. But you don't have to go through what your reasoning is. So it's just more. I'm just. Uh, it's more for you to try the upload part because for the two problems that I'm giving you, literally, there's almost nothing to write. But don't write like just like the answer is seventy because you know just write like the answer is this factorial divided by this factorial, and that happens to be seventy or whatever. So you know, but don't don't you don't have to say why it's uh, uh, you know these combinations of factorials or whatever you got. Yeah, yeah. So like a solution that show, shows what you found, but not like, uh, uh, you know, a lot of like uh, details. It's more like, again, I just want you to try the actual upload part. So it's more today it's more like for you to try how things go. See, like, you know, if you had any difficulties because I can never use Grayscale for upload. So I also don't know how this will work. So don't freak out if, if that, that's not working. It's for, I just want to, if there are issues, that's fine. I just want to know how everyone is, uh, is if you if this, if this worked well for for you but yeah so with that setting place like yeah you cannot take if you don't have any questions you can just like log off of zoom and start taking the quiz uh, and it, then just upload it on grayscale i mean uh eventually i would drop it uh usually what i'll do is like i just give more points to each quiz beyond the minimum so it is kind of like a drop policy but uh, more because I inflate the, the number of points on each quiz. But yeah, like I would drop it if like, but it's too easy, I think. So <laughs> I think people, if you answer it, like would get it right. But yeah, I would drop it if like, that's a problem. Uh, no, you have 30 minutes for doing the quiz and 15 for the submission. So the submission is different from the from the quiz part. And we don't need the submission. Can we, do we have to use, do we have to be on the um, browser thing? To submit? No, the submit the submission. Uh, you will exit the lockdown browser. Yeah. Okay. Because I don't think I'll be able to. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. Right. Yeah. Otherwise, you wouldn't be. Um. Uh, yeah. So right. Um. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, is there are there any other questions about this? Yeah. So uh, right. You can log off. Uh, you you will log off from responders to to do it to do the submission. But yeah. So just do it. Um. Let me know if there are any issues, but don't worry too much about it. So, and I'll see you on Monday. That sounds good. I'll send you like uh, the information about today's class in a couple of minutes and the video for the recordings. All right. Okay. We can hop off the lecture, right? Oh, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Have a good one. Yeah, sure. Okay, so you too.